Hey. Yeah, you. Come on. Hop in the station wagon. We're taking a trip to Times Beach, Missouri. You've most likely heard the term ghost town before. But Times Beach? It's the very definition of the word. Once home to more than 2,000 people, the town was completely evacuated in early 1983 due to TCDD, also known as dioxin contamination. It was the largest civilian exposure to the compound in the history of the United States. And this is how it all began. Well, a man called me, his name was Mr. Brown from uh, Independent Petro, which I believe was down on Shuttle Avenue in St. Louis. Said he had some uh, waste oil that he wanted me to haul, and he never would tell me where it was. I kept saying, well, where's this at? And he said, well, it's a long ways from here. I said, well, if it's a long ways from here, I gotta know how far it is because I don't think I can haul it for nothing if it's too far, and if it's way far, I can't haul it at all. See, oil then was only worth a nickel a gallon. The first time we came down, I guess, and they put up the first dioxin sign was right down there. And I'll never forget my daughter, my youngest daughter, seeing it, and she cried. We were still here at that time? When that, well, right after they put it up, we could still come in but we couldn't stay. And she hates them signs. She says, there's, if there's ever a sign I hate, it's that one that says dioxin. Don't get out of the car, don't roll the windows down, don't do this. She says, this is mine, and they're telling me what to do. So finally, he sent me a sample in the mail. I never forget, I got it in the mail. And it was a little bottle, looked like a peanut butter, Skippy's peanut butter bottle. It was real big and round and about that big, I'd say about a half a quart. And I never forget, I took it in my kitchen and put it in the sink and uh, put it on some paper and I set it on fire in the sink on just a little tiny piece of paper. I wadded it up, it was about all oh, six inches long. And then I took it on my finger and put it to my lips and tasted it. And I, and I told my wife, Evelyn, I said, you know, that's pretty good oil. It burns good, don't look like it has any water content in it. Uh, maybe I can haul that oil for them. Now, initially, I thought this might not be a good idea for Crime City. Russell Bliss, who caused this, didn't mean to. And I don't look at him as a criminal. And neither should any of you. But then I thought, Crime City doesn't have to be about murder. I'm still figuring out what Crime City is, and I think this subject deserves an episode. Was it actually a crime? That's up to you. And now for a little history on the town. Times Beach was founded in 1925, and in its early years, it was primarily a summer resort. But as a result of the Great Depression and gasoline rationing during World War II, that really reduced the feasibility of summer homes. The town later became a community of mostly low-income housing and a small population. But in the years immediately before its evacuation, Times Beach had become a lower middle-class town. Historically, there had always been a small grocery store and a gas station on Route 66 to serve the residents. The five-man sampling team should be here in Times Beach a week or more working 12-hour days. EPA officials asked city officials to arrange for this informal meeting to warn residents men in white suits will be in their community taking samples in the morning. EPA officials confirmed what the residents knew. Times Beach is a suspected dioxin-contaminated site. The testing of Times Beach was moved ahead of some other Missouri sites when EPA officials were notified city workers had become ill after digging a drainage ditch in 1980, and other residents were reporting illnesses and skin rashes. If dioxin contamination is shown to be positive in those tests, then more extensive testing will be done. 
Kathy Leonard, Channel 5 Eyewitness News in Times Beach. During the late 1960s, the Northeastern Pharmaceutical and Chemical Company Incorporated, or NAPACO for short, began operating out of a facility located near Verona in southwestern Missouri. This facility was owned by Hoffman Taft, a company that had produced the Agent Orange herbicide for use during the Vietnam War. And by the time NAPACO ceased its operations, in 1972, Hoffman Taft had been taken over by Syntex Agribusiness. From 1970 to 1972, NAPACO was primarily involved in the production of hexachlorophene, an antibacterial agent used in soap, toothpaste, and common household disinfectants, from 2,4,5-trichlorophenol and formaldehyde. Beginning the process of production with 2,4,5-trichlorophenol that contained 3 to 5 parts per million ppm of dioxin, NAPACO was able to reduce the concentration of dioxin and hexachlorophene to 0.1 ppm. The result of this purification process led to the storage and accumulation of heavily concentrated dioxin still bottoms, or thick, oily residues, in a storage tank located near the facility in Verona. When NAPACO first began operations, the still bottoms were sent to a waste facility in Louisiana for incineration. Although incineration was the best method to destroy dioxins at the time, it was also very expensive. Looking for less costly alternatives, NAPACO contracted the services of the Independent Petrochemical Corporation. However, IPC, a chemical supplier company, knew very little about waste disposal so they subcontracted the NAPACO job to Russell Martin Bliss, who happened to be the owner of a small local waste oil business. Charging NAPACO $3,000 per load, IPC paid Bliss just $125 per load. Between February and October 1971, Bliss collected six truckloads, nearly 18,500 gallons of chemical waste heavily contaminated with dioxin. Bliss took most of the still bottoms to his own storage facility, where the contaminated Napaco waste was unloaded and mixed into tanks containing used motor oils. In addition to his waste oil business, Bliss owned a horse arena and farm where he sprayed waste oils to control the problem of dust. One application kept the dust down for several months those who visited Bliss's property were impressed by how well the technique seemed to work, and it wasn't long before people began to hire him for his dust suppressant services. On May 26, 1971, the owners of Shenandoah Stable, located near Moscow Mills, Missouri, Judy Piet and Frank Hample, paid Bliss $150 to spray the floor of their indoor arena. The waste oil sprayed, which totaled a volume of 2,000 gallons, was uncharacteristically thick and left a pungent, burning odor. Within a few days of the spraying, birds began to drop dead from the rafters of the barns, and horses began to develop sores and lose their hair. Piet and Hample blamed these occurrences on Bliss, who denied responsibility, claiming that the material he sprayed was nothing more than old motor oil. Acting on their suspicions, Piet and Hample removed the top six inches of soil from the entire arena and disposed of it in a landfill. Despite the removal of another 12 inches of soil, a few months later, the horses that came to the arena still became ill. Acting on their suspicions, Piet and Hamble removed the top six inches of soil from the entire arena and disposed of it in a landfill. Despite the removal of another 12 inches of soil a few months later, the horses that came to the arena still became ill. After several months, 62 horses died or became so emaciated that they had to be euthanized. Hamble, Piat, and Piat's two young daughters also became ill, developing headaches, nosebleeds, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. A month after the spraying at Shenandoah, Bliss was hired to spray the arena at Timberline. A month after the spraying at Shenandoah, Bliss was hired to spray the arena at Timberline Stables near Jefferson City, Missouri. Twelve horses died, and children exposed to the arena were diagnosed with a skin condition associated with dioxin poisoning. Suspecting that Bliss's oil was the source of their problems, 
the owners of Timberline removed the top layer of soil from their property. A third arena at Bubbling Springs Ranch near St. Louis was also sprayed around the same time as Timberline and faced similar problems. As at Shenandoah and Timberline, the owners decided to remove the top layer of soil from their arena. Vernon Stout, a road grading contractor, completed the removal in March 1973. Instead of bringing the soil to a landfill, Stout unloaded the soil onto one of his properties and at the nearby home of Harold Minker. The unexplained deaths and illnesses at Shenandoah immediately caught the attention of the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It wasn't until 1973 that tests revealed the presence of trichlorophenol. When trace amounts of the crude trichlorophenol contaminant were administered to the inner surfaces of rabbit ears, blisters developed, which was a characteristic of trichlorophenol poisoning. The unexpected death of some of the affected rabbits, however, led the CDC to run more complex tests. On July 30, 1974, the CDC found that in addition to 5,000 ppm of trichlorophenol and 1,590 ppm of PCBs, the soil samples that were collected from Shenandoah contained over 30 ppm of dioxin. Although little was known about the effects of dioxin on humans, the lethality of small doses in animals was alarming. As a result, the CDC immediately set out to locate other possible sites of contamination. When confronted by the CDC, Bliss stated that he didn't know where the dioxin could have come from. Because dioxin was a byproduct of only a handful of chemicals, trichlorophenol being the most common, the CDC narrowed their search to companies in Missouri using or producing trichlorophenol. Nepico was the only company on the search list that had come into contact with Bliss. Nepaco went out of business in 1972 after the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, had issued a ban that limited the use of hexachlorophene. The ban was motivated by the death of 32 infants in France who were exposed to high levels of hexachlorophene and baby powder. During an inspection of the old Nepico facility in Verona, which was now entirely owned by Syntax Agribusiness, the CDC discovered an old tank filled with 4,300 gallons of Nepico still bottoms at a dioxin concentration of more than 340 ppm. Now, due to a lack of incinerations in proximity to the Verona plant, the proper disposal of the leftover still bottoms wouldn't be completed until 1979. With further investigation of contaminated locations, the CDC advised residents of the Minker and Stout properties to minimize contact with the soil. Samples revealed a dioxin concentration of 0.85 ppm at Minker's property and a concentration of 0.44 ppm at Stout's property. In a 1975 confidential report to the EPA, the CDC also further advised the removal and burial of contaminated soil from both properties. In the same document, however, the CDC reported that the half-life of dioxin was just one year. Based on this estimate, which was later found to be incorrect, Missouri officials decided to forego the recommended cleanup. Today, the half-life of dioxin is estimated to be seven to 11 years. Avoid contact with the, with the area. And, uh, Does that mean move from their home, move from the property? No, we have not said move from your home at this particular point, no. What are you saying? Saying, don't, number one, don't go out and eat the dirt. Although all the questions may not have been answered at today's hearing, the EPA definitely got the message from Missouri's elected officials, and that is to speed up the testing of the contaminated sites and make the Missouri dioxin problem a priority for the EPA. Dan Gray, Channel 5 Eyewitness News, Hillsboro. Uh, we begin to share stories with, e with each other in the community and begin to compare notes of, of um, personal injuries, of uh, health problems, of problems that we'd had with animals that these things had, you know, we might have had a dog die and that didn't seem consequential within itself. 
but when we begin to compare it with the neighbor who lived three blocks over and realize that that story happened to them as well and the, the squirrels without tails and jumping from one tree to another and missing that seemed comical when we saw it as one incident at a time but when we begin to notice that this was happening all over town then then we begin to take it seriously so if this poor town didn't have it bad enough the flood was coming yeah you heard it a flood I remember driving home from work on a Thursday afternoon and I had the radio on and I remember hear, hearing the Corps of Engineers warning the people in the low-lying areas that that there was going to be a flood and they needed to evacuate and I came up on the city park where two residents had become ill when they were putting in a drainage ditch. The odor was really bad and the ground was a purplish color. And um, I remember saying to these people that were collecting the soil samples for the EPA that the city was going to flood. And this one man from the EPA that was collecting the soil samples said, this community can't flood. Um, they hurried and took their samples. I remember they finished their sampling on Saturday morning and around 3 o'clock on Sunday, Times Beach was just inundated by floodwaters. When the water from the rampaging Merrimack River poured through Times Beach, Missouri early in December, it was called the flood of the century. But the news from federal health officials may be worse than the flood. Officials at the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta say preliminary testing shows Times Beach is contaminated with a chemical waste, dioxin. The recommendation is that no one should live here and even cleanup workers should evacuate. The only way I'm leaving here is if they carry me out, forcibly. I stood out there and watched them spread it. I inhaled it. That Ten years ago, I'm still here. I'm going to stay the effect of dioxin on humans is disputed, and Missouri Lieutenant Governor Kenneth Rothman disputes the entire 10-year-long investigation. It's no wonder that people have a distrust of the EPA in Washington. I do. I mean, the, the, there's a real confidence crisis. Ten years have gone by before the order to evacuate. Rothman says if there is a problem, he'll ask the federal government to clean it up with money from the so-called Environmental Superfund. Ron Majors for NBC News. I, I, you know, I'm not playing stupid or anything, but I didn't go to high school. I didn't graduate from high school. Uh, I only charge $5 a barrel to haul it away. And uh, you didn't care what it was because you put it on a truck. I, I worked all I, I've never had a pair of gloves on handling that stuff. So I must have convinced myself there was nothing wrong with it. You didn't think about anything being hazardous. You didn't have it on a barrel. Uh, they didn't say it was hazardous, and I didn't wasn't aware it was hazardous. So you just you roll the barrels on a truck and go to landfill and roll them off, throw them in a big hole. I mean, it just it was just a way of doing things. Missouri's dioxin problem started here in Verona, in southwest Missouri. In the late 1960s and early 70s, the Northeast Pharmaceutical and Chemical Company produced unknown amounts of dioxin as an unwanted byproduct in the manufacture of a face cleanser. The plant went out of business. That brought this man into the picture. My name is Russell Martin Bliss. Bliss, now a former hauler of salvaged oil, was hired at that time to haul away the chemical waste from Verona. He maintains that he was never told that the waste was dangerous. I wouldn't have known what it was if they had have told me what it was. If you want the truth, you could tell me it was some kind of a new jelly and I'd put it on toast and eat it. But I didn't know what dioxin was and still don't know exactly what it is. Officials say dioxin was sprayed in several places throughout Missouri and possibly across the Mississippi in Illinois. In the early 1970s, Bliss sprayed the Bubbling Springs Ranch near Fenton to keep the dust down. He also sprayed the unpaved streets of Times Beach and his own farm. The oil contained dioxin. So in 1972, Times Beach hired Bliss to oil its 23 miles of dirt roads. Due to lack of funding, Times Beach was unable to pave its roads. For $2,400, Bliss sprayed approximately 160,000 gallons of waste oil in Times Beach over a period of four years. The release of the leaked EPA document in 1982 was the first time that Times Beach had learned of its contamination. Residents felt betrayed and publicly criticized the EPA for not informing them of the toxic hazards around their home. 
Since Times Beach had the largest population out of the listed sites, Times Beach became the subject of national media and attention. With pressure from the public, the EPA soon began investigation in Times Beach. Soil sampling was fortuitously completed on December 3, 1982, just the day before Times Beach suffered its worst flood in history, when the Merrimack River breached its banks and rose over 14 feet above flood stage. The residents of Times Beach were evacuated, and by the time the waters began to recede, the EPA had concluded its analysis. Results revealed dioxin concentrations as high as 0.3 ppm along the town's entire network of roads. On December 23, 1982, the CDC publicly recommended that Times Beach not be re-inhabited. Officials were uncertain about the health effects of extensive dioxin exposure, and even more uncertain of how to rid an entire town of it. Because the town was situated on a floodplain, officials were further concerned that subsequent flooding would spread the contamination beyond control. Discussions of a federal buyout commenced on January 7, 1983, when President Ronald Reagan created the Times Beach Dioxin Task Force, which consisted of representatives from the EPA, CDC, FEMA, and Army Corps of Engineers. During a press conference on February 22, 1983, the EPA announced that the federal government would pay $33 million of the estimated $36.7 million cost to buy out the 800 residential properties and 30 businesses of Times Beach. The remaining $3.7 million would be the responsibility of the state. While the announcement was being made to the media behind closed doors, some 200 Times Beach residents were informed of the buyout proposal secondhand. The federal officials today were carefully shielded by guards from the people of Times Beach, waiting outside the news conference room, and the officials left by a back passageway after a 20-minute news conference. They had briefed a few Times Beach officials privately before that conference. By 1985, Times Beach's entire population of well over 2,000 residents had been relocated. Governor John Ashcroft had issued an executive order for the town's disincorporation. Since it contained over 50% of the dioxin in the state of Missouri, and because it was no longer inhabited, Times Beach was the logical choice for the placement of a new incinerator. The construction of the incinerator began in June 1995. Once built, it burned more than 265,000 tons of dioxin contaminated materials from across the state. Uh, you've heard, uh, heard just one of her animals. And then what happened? The guy came and sprayed and uh, said he'd kill the flies and... Sprayed for dust to control the dust in the uh, horse arena. Uh, this is pretty grim. Uh, look at the weight loss here. How many animals did you lose? 62. You had sparrows almost falling out of the sky, didn't you? They did fall out. The cleanup of Missouri was finally completed in 1997 and had cost close to $200 million. In response to the events that transpired in Missouri during the 1970s, a number of laws were passed to regulate the generation and disposal of potentially hazardous products. In 1976, Congress passed the Toxic Substances Control Act, which required the testing of chemicals that could pose an unreasonable risk to the environment. In 1976, Congress also passed the RCRA, which regulated the transportation and disposal of hazardous waste. In 1980, the passage of the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act established a multi-billion dollar super fund to investigate and clean up old abandoned hazardous waste sites. The passage of the CERCLA also defined the liability of a company and ensured that parties responsible for the release of toxic substances are held liable in the case of environmental damage or harm. In 1983, the federal government sued Napaco and its officers, Edwin Michaels and John W. Lee, in United States versus Northeastern Pharmaceutical and Chemical Company. Under the provisions of the CERCLA, Napaco was forced to repay the federal government for its cleanup efforts at the farm of James Denny, the site where Napaco had buried 90 drums of its chemical waste over a decade earlier. 
Scientists agree that dioxin is highly toxic and causes short-term reactions in humans. Some people develop an ugly skin condition called chloracne. Others suffer temporary nerve or liver damage. But tiny amounts of dioxin can kill some laboratory animals and cause birth defects, rashes, nerve disorders, liver dysfunctions, or cancers. The issue is, what does it do to humans? Because the RCRA was not implemented until 1976, Bliss was not legally required to keep records of the chemical wastes he had collected from Napaco. During investigations surrounding the dioxin contamination in Missouri, Bliss maintained that he had no knowledge of the presence of dioxin in the chemical waste he had collected from Napaco. Still, Bliss was the object of many legal pursuits. Over 14,000 citizen suits were filed against Napaco and its officers, Syntex Agribusiness, IPC, and Bliss. Among these were the cases of Piet and Hampel, who in 1976 settled their suit against Bliss for $10,000 and against IPC for $100,000. In 1981, Piet and Hampel also settled for $65,000 from Napaco. IPC paid $1 million to each of Piet's daughters in 1983. Although the decision for relocation in 1982 was made in the best interest and safety of the Times Beach residents, the evacuation was not an easy transition. 800 families had to leave their lives completely behind. As they began to settle into their new lives, their logistical and financial worries were soon replaced by the fear that their children would be afflicted by sudden chronic illnesses. The psychological trauma caused by relocation was immeasurable. The land that was once Times Beach is now Route 66 State Park. One building from the town still exists. The park's visitor center was once a roadhouse from Times Beach's glory days and was the EPA's headquarters for the area. There is a large grass mound beneath which is the debris of the demolished buildings of the former town. The EPA revisited and tested the soil at Route 66 State Park in June 2012. On November 19, 2012, it was reported that soil samples from Route 66 State Park show no significant health risks for park visitors or workers. Several months after the evacuation, the American Medical Association publicly criticized the news media for spreading unscientific information about dioxin and the health hazards associated with it. The AMA stated that there was no evidence of adverse consequences from low-level dioxin exposure. Subsequent studies of potentially exposed people from Times Beach and some other contaminated locations in Missouri have revealed no adverse health outcomes that can be directly linked to dioxin. In a study conducted by the CDC and the Missouri Division of Health, no cases of chloracne, a common symptom of acute dioxin poisoning, were observed in Times Beach residents. By May 1991, Dr. Vernon Hoke, the director of the CDC's Center for Environmental Health had come to the same conclusion as the AMA. Although he had made the official recommendation to permanently relocate Times Beach's residents in 1982, by 1991 he no longer believed that evacuation had been necessary. I was really mad at Russell Bliss first because I said, you took away everything that I ever worked for and I ever loved and now I don't have anything. But I really think deep down he's probably hurting just as much as the rest of us. Because I don't think anybody would go out and do this on purpose. I mean, there can be mean people in the world, but I don't think they'd go out just to destroy a whole town. You can ask the average uh, person, say, do you know where Russell got the oil from? And they can't tell you. And do you know who he hauled it for? And they couldn't tell you that. I think the majority of people don't know who Northeastern Pharmaceutical Company is. They don't know who uh, any of those people are. Uh, only thing they remember is Russell Bliss spread it. Well, 
like I tell everybody from day one, I didn't manufacture one drop of that oil. Well, for many years, we had to drive by and see the deserted buildings. And I thought immediately to my children, I thought, well, what do they think when they drive by there and see the town they used to live in, just deserted and just, just decaying, you know, just sitting there and decaying like that. And I thought, what a shame. It really is a shame, but it does teach a lesson. It teaches that uh, there is a price to pay for man's wrongdoing. That town's paying the price. It paid the price. It just sat there and went to decay. The lawsuits have been settled now, and they're saying the people of Tynes Beach got rich. But you got to stop and think of what the people of Tynes Beach lost. They've lost their homes. They've lost memories. They've lost things that can never be replaced. And I guess everybody's got a right to their feeling. But I don't think we got anything we didn't deserve.